Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Unleash Your Potential, Managing CF Daily Care. My name is Greg Thompson. Uh, I'll be your first speaker for the session today. My fellow speakers today are Kayla and Anna, and they will be introducing themselves later on. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available to all registrants after the event on the CF Foundation YouTube channel. You'll be notified by email when session recordings are available. Uh, under the stage tab on the right side of your, your screen, you'll notice the chat for everyone who is in the session. Uh, if you're in the event tab chat, that is for the full event and is not specific to this session. We will be taking audience questions during the session. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time into the chat box, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible towards the end. Uh, we do have counselors on call at any point, uh, so if you feel overwhelmed by the conversations, please visit the help desk to request to connect with the counselor. Uh, we also want to remind everyone of our event conduct guide, which each participant agreed to while registering for BreatheCon. Uh, namely, please be kind, open-minded, and respectful of everyone's opinions and life experiences. Uh, keep all breakout and chat discussions confidential. Use your real identity. Do not use malicious or offensive speech. And finally, do not ask for or give medical advice. Uh, along those lines, this panel discussion is not intended to be a substitute for medical diagnosis, advice, or treatment recommendations. Uh, do not make any changes to your own treatment plan without first consulting with your care team. Uh, if you have any technology problems during the session, please visit the help desk located in the expo booth area. I'd also like to take this time to thank Stephanie as our panel advisor, Rachel, who is our panel manager, and Christy, who is running this live event. Okay, so that's all the housekeeping. Uh, so we can go ahead and dive into my topic now. Uh, brief introduction for myself. So like I said, my name is Greg Thompson. Uh, I'm a 31-year-old CF patient. I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I work full-time as a mechanical engineer designing district energy systems. Uh, in my free time, I enjoy running, spending time outdoors, video games, and reading. So uh, my topic for this panel discussion is uh, tips and strategies for managing CF care through life's transitions. So I am passionate about this because it's something that I've run into a lot uh, over time. Um, you know, changing life circumstances can create challenges for CF management and anyone uh, affecting your available time, affecting your available brain space. Uh, and especially when those changes mean less supervision or more freedom in the day to day. Uh, stress and fatigue, of course, can also play a part. Um, so adapting to those changing life circumstances could then flip around and leave less time or mental space for CF management, uh, which can then, of course, lead to potential CF struggles. Uh, so I'm going to run through a few strategies I've come up with over time uh, for both kinds of issues. Um, I'll note that for me, kind of depending on the change, and I'm going to go through three different changes that I've had happen in my life, uh, I kind of had different primary issues depending on what the change was. Um, so that's kind of how I've organized my discussion. Uh, but I'll note that, you know, these things may apply to others differently. So um, for each one of these, I'm going to go through what the change was, what the differences were in my life, and how that affected my CF care, and then the strategies that I personally found successful to kind of level my CF care back up and keep things uh, keep things well managed. Um, so uh, first major life transition here is going to be transitioning from high school into college. So obviously some of these big changes, pretty self-explanatory, uh, you know, big changes, more independence in terms of uh, medicine and treatment management, uh, a more variable schedule, including what the demands on my time were, um, especially um, after I started also working on top of being in college. Um, so the main struggles that I ran into during this time were finding uh, enough time for my breathing treatments and then 
remembering to take my daily medicines. Um, so probably no surprise there. Um, finding the time is really the most challenging one with this particular section. Um, so what was my motivation to, to try and try and look at some things to make a change, try and look at some, some ways to level up? Um, the main two were, uh, first, I noticed a bit of shortness of breath during hard exercise. And then um, that was more kind of qualitative. And then quantitative, uh, noticed some wavering in, in my PFT results at CF Clinic. Um, and then especially for this particular time related issue, the problem that I ran into as I started to try and make changes were I had gotten kind of stuck in a routine of subpar treatments that were fast, but not particularly effective. So finding my way back to a more effective treatment felt like I was losing time, even though in reality, I had just gotten used to something that was fast and not very effective. Um, so I came up with two main strategies that helped, and then one that is is kind of a good one to think about as well. So the first one is is finding a motivating factor for my treatment. So what I mean here is finding a reason why I would want to do my treatment and spend the appropriate amount of time. So uh, for me in college, uh, what worked really well was doing something fun. So whether that was watching TV while I was doing my treatment, playing video games, um, reading sometimes, just depending on you know how my day had been, finding something where I, I was looking forward to sitting down and doing my treatment and doing a good job because I knew that I would be doing something fun at the same time. So that was that was what really helped me kind of reprioritize my treatments in the day to day. And then for the medicine struggle, remembering to take my daily medicines, what I did was I switched from having all of my medicines just bottled the way they come from the doctor from the pharmacy. Um, and I switched to a daily medicine organizer, um, as well as reminders on my watch, although I'm sure now phone would work just fine, uh, to take the meds, as well as to remind me to pack the medicine for when I would go to meals, uh, especially living in the dorm, right? You don't want to have to walk back from the dining hall to get meds and then go back to the dining hall again. So kind of, you know, group those two things together. And it meant that I was more likely to both remember to pack my meds and then also to remember to take them with meals. Another thing that can be helpful, um, especially in college, if you're living in a dorm or, you know, living in an apartment with roommates is if you're able to kind of leverage your community to help with that, that can be very helpful as well. So, you know, consider, for example, studying with friends during your treatment, uh, watching TV, playing board games, that kind of thing. Um, again, if that's something you and your friends are, would be comfortable with. Um, and that that kind of all just comes down to personal comfort level and how much you want to disclose uh, to those close to you. Um, I will note that there are, there are actually other sessions that I think are kind of relevant to the CF disclosure topic. Um, so if you're attending this one, then you should be able to to catch back up with those uh, once the recordings are released. Um, so those were the the main strategies that. I used in college when my main issue was finding the time to uh, do a good job with my CF maintenance. Um, so that's that was all of college. Of course, worked my way through college, graduated college, moved on to full-time work, and that's the next big transition. So the full-time work transition is challenging, but in a different way. So the main challenges that I personally faced transitioning from college to full-time work was I got a little bit of schedule regularity back because my work schedule was fairly set. So more, more of a set work schedule, but those days were also longer days with less breaks because I didn't have kind of the breaks in between classes and work that I had during college. And, and this is the key that I struggled with here is less brain space available after work. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, I, I work as a mechanical engineer. That's what I've done since I graduated college. It's a relatively demanding field uh, from a brain power standpoint. 
And so what I would find is that by the time I'd be done with the workday, I, I just wouldn't have any gas left in the tank to think about anything else. Um, and we'd also, for good measure, throw on top of that, you know, additional newfound responsibilities, living completely on my own instead of in a dorm. So I've got rent to deal with. I've got my own health insurance to deal with now and all those additional kind of responsibility factors that just piled on to that already manifesting struggle about not feeling like I had enough brain power to keep track of everything I need, needed to keep track of. So the main struggles that this kind of rolled into for me, um, back to the treatment again, struggles with maintaining a full and good treatment, as well as, as some struggles maintaining kind of normal day-to-day -day health and, and personal health items. Um, so, you know, with the treatment where I really struggled was just remembering all the steps, right? We all have our own treatment regimens. They all have specific steps that we're supposed to do. And where I would really struggle with that is kind of keeping track of all those things that I need to do. So getting that back in was was key as well as kind of maintaining, um, you know, normal day-to-day -day stuff. I'm going to give an example here. It's, I apologize in advance. Um, I, sometimes I would struggle to remember to floss and brush my teeth because I would just feel so exhausted at the end of the day, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so where did the motivation to level up come in on this side? Um, the, there were kind of, there was one main thing that really, really pushed me. And that was, I got a, a very kindly worded, a nicely worded letter um, from my insurance provider, uh, letting me know that I was not refilling my medicine as regularly as I probably should have been. Um, so that was the real, the real motivation to level up on this side. Um, <clears throat> and it kind of worked against the challenge that I've kind of been mentioning this whole time, which is, you know, brain space can feel finite. There's only so much that I can keep track of uh, on the day to day. So what strategies did I start to use here? Uh, first one, and you can probably see it up on screen now, is I managed to get all of my treatment stuff into one location. Uh, you can see it there, it's kind of called treatment cart. I've named it various things. Treatment cart's probably a nice one uh, to call it that just has all the stuff I need to do my treatment all grouped together so that I don't have to be hunting for anything. Um, and it, it's a cart, so it's mobile. I can move it around the house as needed. So if, you know, if I plan on watching TV during my treatment, I can move it to the living room. If I plan on uh, reading, I can move it to, you know, I can move it to the office, that kind of thing. Um, so that was the first step. The second step, and it's it's on the next slide, I believe, is I basically, I worked with my care team and I just fully wrote out my entire treatment regimen down to, you can kind of see there, down to specifically exactly what I'm supposed to be doing in each step. Um, and this I found really helpful on those days when I came home from work just completely exhausted, nothing left in the tank, basically just enough energy to get home, eat dinner, and then try and do a treatment. I no longer had to remember everything I need to do. I just had to follow a list. And for me, just having to follow a list was just enough to make sure that I hit all the steps properly. Um, so that was the next tool that I kind of added to my tool belt. Um, and then the one more thing that I found really helpful kind of in this phase of my life is uh, adding a habit tracker. So uh, habit trackers, at least in my mind, are great memory tools, um, and they also excel at being versatile. You can kind of program the tracker up or down as needed. So when, a, as an example, when I first started using a habit tracker, I had everything in there. I mean, I had, you know, morning medicine. I had brush teeth. I had wash face. I had basically, in a, in a very real way, is basically like the treatment regimen just for like day-to-day -day healthcare stuff. Um, and then, you know, kind of as, as I got used to my new routine, as I got used to the additional responsibilities of, of kind of living on my own, I've pared it down. And these days, I still do use the habit tracker. I still find it very, very valuable. 
Um, and for reference, I've been working full time coming up on nine years now, so almost a decade. Um, but what I do these days, because I don't necessarily need every single thing written out like the way I did before, is now I kind of group items together. So, for example, you know, in the morning, I've got just one habit that says, you know, wake up, take your medicine, take your trikafta, and, you know, write out what you need to do for the day. Instead of having, you know, 30 some odd habits that I'm keeping track of, it, I'm now down to maybe 10 or 15, and they're just kind of groups depending on what time of the day it is. Um, and then what I do with that is if there are any items that I'm consistently having trouble doing, then I break those back out into individual items until I'm more consistent again and I feel comfortable throwing them back into a group. Um, I'll note, so we've got some examples of different apps up on the screen. You know, some of these are iOS, some are Android. Um, some are free. I will say probably most, most habit trackers are paid depending on how many habits you have in them. Um, but another option, if you're more of a pen and paper person, is you can, of course, just make a manual habit tracker. There are all kinds of templates you can follow. They all work pretty well. Uh, the key is just making sure you're accountable to yourself to actually get the habits done every day and kind of build the chain of the good habit. Um, the other thing I want to note that's not necessarily applicable for me, but I have heard can be applicable to people is, is if you have medicine that needs to be taken on a very strict schedule, you know, feel it's definitely worth considering setting just a daily alarm on your phone or you know any device that you keep with you, uh, maybe a smartwatch, something like that, that just reminds you exactly what time uh, you're supposed to be taking any meds that are on a very strict schedule. So those are all the tools that have really kind of helped me level up my CF care, balancing full-time work with that CF care. Um, I will note there's one more big transition. We're kind of, you know, everyone's in the middle of it right now, or a lot of people are in the middle of it right now, rather. And that's, you know, how does how does adding Trikafta or a different modulator, another modulator, change your CF care? Um, I will note here, and I noted it in the um, in the housekeeping as well. Uh, you know, this is not specific medical medical advice. Anything that you think of here, you want to discuss with your care team before you do anything with it. Um, but you know, work with your clinic team. Figure out if potentially, if you're on a modulator, if that provides more flexibility for abnormal situations. Um, you know, something like, for example, a short work trip or something like that. Figure out if if that kind of changes the equation sometimes for you. And, and what you can do with that, because I know, and and I'm not going to steal any of Kayla's thunder because her her topic is all about travel. But you know, travel is another thing that can be highly variable depending on how you're doing it. And so, if you have a little bit of flexibility available there uh, after discussion with your care team, that's probably something that it makes sense to uh, to take advantage of. Um, so. Having said all that, that fully covers everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, just a quick summary. You know, it's it's all about, or at least for me, what I found success with was figuring out why my struggle was there in terms of, of keeping my CF care solid, and then thinking through what strategies I had available to try and to try and fix that. Um, I've talked through the ones that work best for me. Interested to hear later on in the Q&A session if anyone has any other ones that they found really successful or uh, any questions anyone has. Uh, with that, I'm going to throw it over to Kayla. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today and talk about tips for traveling with disease and chronic illness. Um, if I can grab my slides, that would be awesome. Christy? Can you all hear me and see me? Perfect. So um, 
the next slide, I'm going to introduce myself. I have cystic fibrosis, obviously. I was diagnosed at birth. I've had two double lung transplants, and I have CFRD. I am a really brittle diabetic, so that definitely plays a role in my travel. Right now, I am a full-time nomad, and that means that I don't have a permanent residence. And within the last few years of being healthy, I've been to 10 countries and 42 U.S. states. So now I'm going to talk about my goals and objectives for uh, my talk today on the next slide. My first goal is to ensure health and safety throughout the trip. This means to maintain the best possible health while ensuring that all the necessary medications and supplies are packed, accessible, and sufficient during the trip and in case of emergencies. Also to have a clear understanding and plan for accessing medical care at the destination, including knowing local hospitals and how to commu communicate your medical needs in a different language if possible. The goal number two is to prepare thoroughly for all aspects of travel. That means to engage in detailed planning and coordination with your care teams, with your insurance providers, and with your travel companions well in advance of the trip to ensure that all the medical and logistical needs are anticipated and addressed before going. And to research and understand the medical system of the destination you're traveling to, including specific risks associated with the area and the availability of required medical testing and treatment. I'll go into that all later. And goal number three is to maximize the travel experience while managing health concerns. This means to balance the desire for adventure and exploration with the realities of traveling with medical conditions, ensuring that all your activities that you have planned are with your health considerations first and foremost, and to build resilience and mental readiness for dealing with unexpected health issues, to utilize the support network your support network and contingency plans to address potential challenges ahead of time. So tips for traveling with disease and illness, let's go into tip number one, which is preparation. The first thing I recommend is to meet with your medical team. That is to discuss and understand what's expected from you before you travel and while you're away traveling. I highly recommend to take notes on this, to bring somebody if you have a caretaker, and um, to write down everything that's needed and when it's needed so you can get to work on researching medical centers in the area that you're traveling to and making sure that they provide all of the tests needed to schedule tests ahead of time, to understand out of pocket costs and anything else that's needed. So I did mention I am a travel travel full time and right now I'm living in Baja California in Mexico. So I do have travelers insurance. However, it only covers me for emergency um, hospitalizations and medications. So while I travel, I do do out of pocket blood work as a transplant patient. And I do that bi-weekly. So before traveling to Mexico, I actually researched labs in all the destinations that I was traveling to. I was able to find their phone number. I was able to go on WhatsApp and message them and send over my tests so that they could confirm that these tests could actually be done where they were. And then I was able to ask the out-of-pocket costs for these tests. This allowed me to go in knowing that it was possible to get the blood work out of pocket. So it opened up the doors for me to go anywhere that I wanted to, but the unfortunate part was paying out of pocket, which is about like $250 each blood test that I get. So that means that I may decide to travel to less expe expensive destinations so that I can budget in these out of pocket costs. Next is ordering medications and supplies ahead of time. I count all of my medications before I leave and I pack at least 50% more medications than needed. So if I'm going on a trip for two weeks, I'll pack one full week of extra medications in case you have an emergency, you end up in the hospital and you can't get all of those medications at the hospital you're at, or you, um, your flight gets canceled or something. I also recommend you pack all out of over the counter and prescription emergency medications separately. By packing them separately, it'll allow you to put it in whichever bag you have while you're on the go. Um, one example of 
really making sure that you pack these medications. I went to Hawaii and I was hospitalized and the island actually didn't have the medication that I needed and they weren't able to get it in the time that I needed it. So I wasn't expecting it to be there as long. And this was a medication that was like critical to my care. So I actually ended up having to fly a friend out to bring me that medication because it was cheaper. Well, really it was the only way I could get the medicine right away, but that all was out of pocket. No insurance was gonna cover that. One tip that I've learned over time is something called a vacation override. This is something that you do when you call your insurance company and you can ask for a vacation override. Usually that means they're gonna give you double the amount of your maximum that you usually get. So if you have a medication and it gives you 30 days usually, you can get approval for vacation override and it will give you 60 days. And that allows time for you to travel and be away. And if you're abroad, I highly also recommend to research where you're going, if there's any shots that might be needed and prepare yourself for any potential diseases that you could get overseas and ask your doctor for medications ahead of time in case you do get that. Maybe you don't have to be hospitalized if you already have medications can tr that can treat this problem. Like for me being in Mexico, if I were to accidentally drink the water and get sick, I have medications that will help with a stomach bug now. Of course, I'm gonna call my team and talk to them before I start it, but at least I have it on hand and can start it right away. So let's talk about tip number two, which is insurance plans. Insurance plans, on the next slide please, is designed to give travelers peace of mind and financial protection against the risks of travel. So there's usually three types of coverage for insurance plans. It's protection for your financial expenses, protection for your well-being, and protection for your personal belongings. I'm solely going to talk about healthcare travel insurance in um, this presentation. Travel insurance usually costs about four to 10% of your overall travel. So if you travel for a longer period of time, it's gonna cost more. There's budget plans out there, but they cover a lot less. So you wanna read the details very, very closely. Domestic and international trips are fairly similar, except for the fact that when you travel out of, <clears throat> out of country, they may not have access to all of the same resources that we have in the States. So you do wanna do all of the intense research you can. Domestically, uh, traveling means that you're traveling in your own country. You can call your insurance provider or go online to understand what's covered. If you're traveling out of state, it's best to ask if you're travel if you're covered for x-rays, hospitalization, or even evacuation. If you do have government state insurance, you can call your insurance plan and ask what the steps are to gain temporary insurance in the location that you're traveling to. And usually they're able to help you with that as long as you do it a uh, far time ahead of time before your trip. International, check your insurance for the length of time that it covers. If you're going somewhere like Europe and you're gonna to travel to a few different countries, you wanna make sure that you get a multi-trip policy so that you're covered in all of those different places that you're going to because insurance will look at it as a separate trip from just going to Spain to go to Italy. And plan for worst case scenarios. You wanna think um, if you're going abroad, how long will it take you to actually get evacuated from where you are? What are the steps to do that? And then make sure you're covered. I have three examples of the top tra uh, traveler insurance on the market right now, which is Cigna Global, William Russell, and Geo Blue Explorer, which is what I have. And I really like it so far. Um, on the next tip, number three, the next slide is packing medications and supplies. This is a big one. I always recommend that you try to pack as much as you can in your travel on uh, your carry on bag if you're going on a plane, because that means that it's going to usually be with you and you have your eyes on it at all times. So how do I pack? Well, this is something that I, a skill that I've kind of adapted over time. The easiest thing for me to do to pack all of my medications and supplies, including emergency medications, is to one, make a list. So mentally make a list and then write everything down so that as you're packing, you can cross things off your list. A way that I organize is actually by organizing by category. So I can do this by disease or by organ. I usually do it by organ because it's easiest for me. So I think 
lungs. What is everything I need to go on this trip with my lungs? My nebulizers, my inhalers, etc. And then I'll move on to my pancreas. I'll pack enzymes, insulin, all of that stuff. And I'll check it off as I go down my list. And once I've gone through everything, I'll actually switch and go over my specialties and my illnesses. And then I'll cross-reference like that to make sure that I have everything packed. I organize all of my medications into weekly organizers. Just as Greg says, it is a time saver. It's super helpful. And this will um, make sure that everything is already packed. I do recommend if you pack in weekly organizers to tape around because I have had one of my organizers explode on the plane and all of my pills were everywhere. And it took me a few hours to get everything organized and pack them back in the weekly organizers. If you have uh, a transplant or something else where maybe some of your medications can vary on um, their, your dosages, pack that bottle on the side and that will make sure that you remember to put it in your bag separately. And I always pack all of my emergency supplies over the counter or prescription separately. And um, I was going to bring the little example of how I pack them, but I forgot to put it over here. So basically it is a separate little um, like container like pocket thing and I can open it and it's labeled one through 10 and I have a key on the back that says one through 10 what each thing is and I'll bring that in my purse in my backpack anytime that I travel I'll bring that with me and even though I'm saying pack everything on your carry-on I do recommend that you'll pack at least one week or at least a couple of days of extra medication in your checked luggage or with your travel companion if your bag was to be stolen it's going to take a lot of time and effort for you to go to the hospital or to fly home or to just acquire all of those medications all over again so um I also advise you, if you are going to pack medications, you can bring a separate personal item on a plane with you. So airlines actually allow you to bring an extra personal size bag on the plane full of medications free of charge. I recommend you go to the airline, you print the policy, you print a uh, list of all of your medications with your doctor's letterhead signed by your doctor and bring it with you. So if you do encounter somebody that maybe isn't as welcoming to this or doesn't know the policy, you can show them the policy and they will let you straight on the flight. Do not pack anything other than medications. They are subject to check. And if you have any personal items, they can charge you for that extra bag. So tip number four, let's go into it on the next slide. It is researching medical access in the area of travel and mentally preparing. Researching hospitals, researching in the area or areas that you're traveling to to get an idea of which hospital you preference going to in case of an emergency is highly, highly recommended. I ask myself questions when I travel, like where is the closest local hospital? Where's the closest CF accredited center? Where is the closest transplant center? And if I had my choice, which hospital would I wanna be taken to? This is in case there is an emergency you can tell you know an ambulance or a cab driver where to go really really fast you don't even have to think about it it's already on your mind and you know exactly where to go i would recommend also forcing yourself outside of your comfort zone to mentally prepare and think through any emergency situation that could happen. By doing this, it's really uncomfortable. It may trigger some PTSD, but it allows you to go through all of these steps in your head ahead of time. And then later on, it'll take the stress off traveling because you already know who you're gonna call and steps one, two, three, what are the first things you're gonna do to get help. I recommend leaning on support systems and sharing with your travel companions and emergency contacts where you'd want to go and what to do in case of an emergency. They may be able to advocate for you um, if there is an emergency. So something that was really bothering me, stressing me out is on my first international trip, I was really stressed out about my concern for dehydration, constipation, and all of my CF stomach issues. I had had that happen in the past where I was traveling and I ended up being on a ventilator because of this and brought back to the States and it was a really long recovery. I voiced this to my travel partner who at that time was my husband traveling with me to Japan and I told him I'm really stressed out I don't even know if I can do it I just have so much anxiety about this trip and so what he did was build a checklist for water 
going in a month before our trip. And every day I had to have the amount of water on there, check it off one month ahead of time and during the duration of our trip. And I will tell you, it gave me peace of mind that I did everything possible to put myself in a positive um, circumstance for it not to happen. And I was in control of that. A pro tip traveling abroad is to download Google Translator app ahead of time in the language of where you're going and to learn the emergency contact numbers in the language or in the country you're going to, as well as the words for help or emergency or fire. All of those words are really good to know and to save in your phone so that you can immediately ask for help if needed. So number five, tip number five on the next slide is documents. Um, This is a really straightforward example of the documents you need when traveling domestically or internationally. You can screenshot this, you can ask for these resources afterwards. Um, A lot of them are the same. However, if you travel internationally, you're gonna need a few more papers and um, then if you're traveling domestically. So contact information on the next slide, tip number six is contact information, emergency information. No matter what stage of health you're in, I recommend traveling and carrying emergency um, contact information with you at all times. So what I do is I actually print a list of all of this information that you see here, and I print multiple copies of it. If I don't have a printer, which I don't in my van when I'm traveling, I just write it down on a piece of paper and I use tape to like, faux laminate it and then I put it in my purse, in my backpack, in my carry-on, in my husband's bags. I put my emergency contacts everywhere. On that I have my personal in case of emergency contacts as well as my travel partner contact and I specify who's traveling with me. My contacts of my hospital, my doctor, and I put a list of my diseases and illnesses, as well as anything that would be like keywords for somebody if they found you on the side of the street to know, which would be insulin dependent diabetic, organ transplant, a list of my allergies, so that if they need to treat me, like as soon as they see me without even looking up my name or knowing who I am, they'll see that and they'll know oh, don't do this, or hey, do this, you know, she may have these issues. Um, I distribute these in all of my bags, like I said, in case I'm found with one bag and not the other. And then I also bring a, a printout of the manufacturers of any devices I have. So if you have a nebulizer or an oxygen concentrator or feeding tube device, I print out those manufacturer numbers. When I went on my honeymoon, I was on, I was dependent on oxygen and I travel with a portable oxygen concentrator. And about day three of our trip, my concentrator actually stopped working. It would only work when it was plugged into the wall, which was going to be a huge problem because we had all these plans to sightsee and be in the car and take a drive. And so what I did was I pulled out that manufacturer number, called them right away. And within 24 hours, they had a new oxygen concentrator to my hotel door and everything was fixed. So um, having those prints out just saved time saves time from looking online, which I know we can all do nowadays, but it's just great to have it there and have it ready. So on the next slide is tip number seven, accommodations. The most simple way to think about accommodations is to think about what do you, what are must haves for you and your travel partner? This doesn't mean what do I want? What sort of um, place do I want to stay? It's more of like, what medically is necessary for you to travel in a safe way. So for example, if you're on an oxygen concentrator or something that needs to be plugged in, you most likely probably won't go camping. Nowadays, there are ways around most everything. You can use solar power, you can use a Jackery if you wanna camp. But if you are gonna use these, um, these, uh, you know, adaptive ways of charging, I would get them ahead of time and I would try it out at home before traveling just to make sure that they're able to power everything that you need. But when I used to travel and I'd have like a million different devices on me, I'd actually prefer to stay in a hotel rather than an Airbnb. And the way I thought about that was if I had a problem where the the outlets go out, electricity isn't working, well, they can instantly help me. They can change rooms. They can get somebody up to me right away. But otherwise, really, I in an Airbnb, I'd have to call for help. I'd have to get the hose. It'd take 
many more steps to get help. I also want everybody to keep in mind proximity to hospitals, clean water sources, and food sources. If I'm, I'm in Los Angeles, it may take me over an hour to get to the hospital I want to go to if I'm staying somewhere across town. But if I stay real close to my center, it might take me five minutes to get there. So I have a better opportunity of going to my center in case of emergency and not being taken somewhere else. Another thing to think about is weather or any other thing that could kind of sway the way you pack. If you are in in snow, you want to pack extra things like gloves and things to keep you from getting pneumonia or extra things for hydration if you're going somewhere salty. And then lastly, you would think about your own budget and preferences. So number eight is contingency plans on the next slide. And I want you everyone to keep in mind different contingency plans. If you're planning, it's never fun to think about these, un, uh, these unwanted interruptions. However, with chronic illness, it's just necessary. I cannot count the number of trips where I've needed to lean on my contingency plans. You can talk to your doctor about this. Usually my doctors have actually had me come up with them and just talk them over with them to make sure that I've thought everything through before I travel. Last summer, I went to Alaska with my husband and I was not feeling myself. I felt off. Nothing was wrong though. And I kept calling the hospital saying, you know, I'm feeling off. I don't know what's wrong. I'm feeling off. I don't know what's wrong. I called them for like six days in a row. And then I made the call and I went to the emergency center and I drove like eight hours to get to the main hospital in Alaska and Anchorage. And I knew that that was a hospital I wanted to go to because if something was actually wrong, I'd want top notch treatment, which was going to be there. And at first I tested negative for everything. And I was like, I know something's wrong in my gut. So I got discharged and I stayed really close to the hospital because I just felt like it wasn't, oh, it wasn't right. Well, I ended up getting a positive for a blood culture and I was hospitalized there. And so I was happy with that because I felt most comfortable being there. Um, and so I did all that research ahead of time, which was really great. On another trip, I went to um, France and I talked over if I got COVID-19, you know, what would I do? Would I have to fly back? Would I stay there? What, what would happen? And going to Europe was totally different because I was able to have top line, top of the notch hospitals and I could just go to the hospital there and they'd have the same treatment as they would in the U.S. So it was really great. Um, don't just assume when you travel that you're going to get your most common lung infection or something that you normally battle. Think broader to the area. If you're going to Africa, think about what types of risks and infections you could get there and then pack the medications ahead of time. Like I mentioned before, talk to your doctors about that. I'd also recommend talking to your travel partner about your contingency plan so they can advocate for you if needed and to lean on your resources and your village. If you have people in the state that you're traveling to, you might want to contact them and let them know, hey, I'm coming. Is it okay if I call you if I ever need something? You know, this is my plan and talk it over because you may need somebody to actually advocate for you. So if we go to the next slide, number nine is it takes a village, which just means leaning on your travel partner and the people around you and talking things out with them, telling them where your emergency contact lists are, where your list of medications are, and all of those things. I went to New York and I was visiting my best friend and this was like the same year as my transplant in 2018. And I talked to her, you know, she was really familiar with my CF and everything that I do, but I just talked to her about where I'd want to go, what would needed to be done if I did encounter this common infection that happens for me. And it happened. I got this infection on the plane. I tried to battle through it the first night. I couldn't. I woke her up in the middle of the night. She took me to the hospital and thank God I actually prepped her on how to advocate for me pro properly because I was giving pain medication. And, you know, even though I can talk for myself, I was in so much pain that it was really hard to advocate for myself. So number 10 is just to have fun, everybody. Enjoy your trip. And remember that health is number one because without your health, you really can't have fun. You'll have to go home or, you know, take time to think about your health when you want to think about having fun. So the next thing is a really exciting topic. Anna's going to talk about her dog. I cannot wait to hear about this. Yay! Hey y'all, I am super excited. Um, just a quick intro, my name is Anna. I'm 23 years old. Um, I have cystic fibrosis. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, and I live with my partner, our cat, and my now retired CF service dog. His name's Hamilton, he's seven. He's gonna pop up real quick. Come here, come here. 
he's enjoying his retirement. He's a bit lazy now, um, but a little bribery gets us far. Um, and I'm currently in my second year of veterinary school in my spare time. I really like to hike and read. Um, and today we're going to talk about cystic fibrosis service dogs. Um, so if we want to pop to the next slide, I'm just going to give you guys a super quick rundown on the basic um, differences between the different types of assistance animals in the United States. And this, there is a resource document that'll go out to you guys um, that has a little bit of more in-depth explanations with the laws that actually relate to this. Um, but the quick version is that a service dog is a dog that is trained to perform a task that directly mitigates a disability. Um, so an example of that would be the left picture in the image, which is me with Hamilton um, and Johns Hopkins when I was hospitalized for a couple weeks. Um, and the big thing with service dogs is they are trained to do a task, which is um, could be like alerting to low blood sugar, pulling a wheelchair, something of that nature. Um, I'm going to give some examples of tasks that Hamilton would do when he was working um, later in this presentation. The other thing that service dogs um, undergo as part of their training is public access training. So getting comfortable around children, dogs, loud noises, um, just different environments that they might encounter um, throughout their career. Um, an important thing to note when we're talking about service dogs is that emotional support does not count as a task because it's not a trained behavior. So the laws don't overlap emotional support animals. Um, I'll talk about just a little bit here, um, but they are an animal that provides emotional support to someone with a disabling mental health condition. Um, they're not the same as service dogs. They have access rights in dorms and apartment buildings and things like that. Um, and they provide fantastic assistance to people with mental health challenges, but they don't have the same ability to like walk into a restaurant um, as a service dog does in the United States. Um, so an emotional support animal would be in the right on this image. So it can be a cat, it can be a dog, it can be a hamster, um, and they just have rights in housing situations. Um, and the last category of assistance animal that will kind of just give you a quick rundown today is a therapy dog. Um, so that would be like the one in the middle image. Um, if you've ever been in a hospital um, and you see like a dog kind of walking through the floors and like saying hi to patients, um, that is more than likely a therapy dog. They go through kind of the public access training aspect that service dogs do where they get comfortable around kids and medical equipment um, and other animals but they don't perform a task and they don't have just one handler that has a disability um, they'll visit nursing homes and schools and hospitals to help um, people there feel more comfortable so I hope that was comprehensive. If not, we can ask questions later. Um, I'm going to get into my story with Hamilton specifically next. We can hop to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so these are pictures of Hammy, um, and they're just kind of going in chronological order. So before Hamilton, um, I was around high school when we started talking about a service dog for me um, as a treatment management option. Um, I was very sick in about 2018. Um, I obviously have CF, but with that, I was having CF-related arthritis symptoms with chronic pain, um, and then also CF-related orthostatic intolerance. So bending down would make me dizzy. Um, I would have like dizzy and fainting spells pretty often, and I was being managed by a cardiologist and um, a chronic pain doctor, and then my pulmonologist. Um, and that was pretty challenging in high school. I was constantly relying on others for help. I felt like a burden a lot of the time. I didn't have the like freedom and independence to do a lot of things that my um, like other junior and senior classmates could. Um, so I was pretty limited in activities and I was looking for options to kind of help me have more freedom. Um, so I talked first with my care team and my family um, and then also some dog trainers in my community that I knew um, who worked with service dogs or had their own. Um, and we opted to work with a private um, program of trainers and things like that to get Hamilton. So he was um, obtained from a, a breeder who does a lot of service dogs um, and he was thoroughly temperament tested and we worked with a trainer to get him um, uh, trained up and like graduating training in about two years. So you can see in these pictures, these were both when he was pretty young and he was still undergoing training. Um, and then in the next slide, you can see some pictures of him as he's getting a little bit older. Um, so that one of him on the left is just at a training meetup, getting comfortable with other service dogs in the area um, and a professional training environment. And he also did spend quite a lot of time with me in the hospital, which was fantastic because I'm sure you guys know I was not, you know, not feeling great in the hospital, not very independent. And it was really nice. Um, the company aspect was great, but it was also very helpful for a couple of the task reasons that we'll talk about later. Um, and then he went to college with me. So the picture on the right is actually him um, on the uh, hospital that was on my college campus. So he did high school and college with me. Um, and then we can go just one over. Sorry. 
one slide forward. Yeah, perfect. And then in college, I was able to start Trikafta in 2019. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the drawbacks of having a service dog a little bit later. But because of the fact that my symptoms were so well managed on Trikafta and the fact that there is um, there's like some social implications when you work a service dog, I decided that for me, um, the benefits didn't really outweigh like the social implications um, of working a service dog every day. So he was able to retire because I was doing so much better and I just really didn't need his help anymore, which was a little bit bittersweet. Um, and you can see all the other pictures on the slide are us hiking. Um, I am now obviously in veterinary school, partially because of my experiences with Hamilton and that is me with some cows um, in vet school. And then on the right is us hiking. You may see there are a couple other pictures in here that are a little more recent. He is down a leg. You are not crazy. Um, he did lose a leg this summer because of some health issues. So just if you notice that you are not um, hallucinating or, you know, not an optical illusion. All right. And then I think we can go to the next slide. Um, we're going to talk about just some quick benefits of service dogs. Um, big one here is symptom management. Um, we're going to talk about the specific tasks a little bit later that they can do to help manage your symptoms. Um, but for me, I was able to catch certain medical episodes sooner in their progression. So I could stop them from getting to like a very, very bad coughing fit where I was like down and out for the day. Um, I wasn't getting to a complete fainting spell from my orthostatic intolerance. Um, and in addition to them being less serious, they were less frequent because I was able to manage them differently as a result of my symptoms being a lot more managed. I was a lot more independent. I could go more places. I could do more things. Um, I felt safer going out in public by myself without family to help me because if I did have like a coughing um, episode or a fainting spell, like I didn't feel like I was going to be completely alone without my family there. And I felt like I was going to be able to um, kind of brave the course no matter what happened. And then to go with that, I personally, especially like during a time when I was like growing up and trying to get comfortable being more independent, I felt like a burden on a lot of my family and friends. And I don't think like a lot of us, I think a lot of us relate to that, but we shouldn't necessarily feel that way. But I did. So for me, having Hamilton, who was always happy to help, like he loved working um, during his career, like that made me feel a lot more comfortable um, asking him for help versus like my parents or my friends who, you know, we're all teenagers and we're having a tough time or in college, like I didn't have a lot of super close friends early on. Um, so having Hamilton to help was fantastic. Um, so overall, just a quick benefits of service dogs recap. I really recommend um, considering them for people whose symptoms might be poorly managed and significantly impact their day-to-day -day life. Um, the other thing to consider as we talk about some of these tasks that service dogs can do is that if you aren't struggling a lot in public, you can have just a dog at home who isn't a service dog and you can think about maybe training them. Like, is there anything they can do to help your day-to-day -day life? Because just like you can train a dog to heal, most dogs are pretty trainable. You can teach them to like pick stuff up if that's something you struggle with. Um, so I think we're going to go to the exciting slides now, which are the tasks for cystic fibrosis. Um, and these are not a comprehensive list of tasks. Um, the resource document that you guys are going to get later probably has a couple more examples. Um, but dogs are very trainable. These are just tasks that Hamilton did for me with how um, my disability was affecting me and what he was like eager to do and happy to do. Um, so the first group is medical alert tasks. And that is just alerting to a medical stimuli with a trained behavioral response. Um, so if you have CF related diabetes, that could be alerting to changes in blood sugar. Um, as you'll see in that first video, if we're able to play it, um, he's going to alert to a change in my breathing pattern. And he just kind of boops me in the face um, and he is trained to be persistent with it so that if I ignore him um, and don't go get my inhaler or don't go stop what is likely an incoming coughing episode, he's going to be like, no, girl, you really need to go do your medication. Um, and then kind of similar for me personally was the scratching alert. So I have really severe drug allergies to drugs that many of my respiratory infections were uh, susceptible to. Um, so I had to take drugs that I was allergic to. And I had really severe reactions that would often start as an itchy rash, like a pruritic um, high V response. So he actually was trained to alert to scratching. And that was very specific to me, but it was something I talked to my doctor about and talked to his trainer about. And that was the solution that we found. And same thing here, you're going to see he's really pushy about it because I'm very stubborn. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, and that just allowed me to check and see, um, you know, do I need to take a Benadryl? Is that just like a little bit of an itch or is that maybe an impending allergic reaction that I need to get ahead of? 
Um, so the next category of tasks that we're going to talk about is going to be on the next slide. Um, mobility assistance tasks are just a wide group of tasks that a service dog can perform for anyone with mobility disabilities. Um, so this is non-weight bearing, um, and we'll kind of show you some weight bearing tasks a little bit later. Um, but in this first video, it's a targeted item retrieval. I ask him to go get a pouch of my medications. You can train a dog to really go retrieve anything if they're um, amicable to it. Um, so we can play that video and he'll just run and grab my meds. And I love that video. You can see like how happy he is. He totally doesn't care. Whereas like, I think we've all asked someone to be like, hey, can you grab this? And like, even though they don't mind, they're having a bad day and then you feel bad for asking. And Hammy just literally did not care. So that made me feel a lot better asking for help. Um, and then the other video is another non-weight bearing mobility assistance task. Um, he can open doors with a push. And there have been times where I'm using a mobility aid, sometimes just like getting wheeled by hospital transport in a wheelchair, or I have like an IV pole with me. And this was really helpful for that reason. Um, and he just pushes a door button on command in that video. Amy, go button. Go button. Awesome. And then on the next slide, you'll see um, he was very adaptable. Um, so he knows how to close doors, which was super helpful for me in the hospital. If like a nurse just steps out, forgets to close the door, I'm in bed hooked up to like six different IV pumps. It was so nice to be able to just be like, hey, dude, can you go close the door? Um, and I think that should be the next video that plays. Close it. Yeah. Um, and then he also for the same, this was, I think, filmed in the same hospital room. He can open the doors too with an IV pole um, and not with a button, just with a tug. Sesame. Good boy. Yes, Hamilton. And the command is Sesame for open Sesame. You can teach them to do it to any command, but I just thought that was kind of a geeky thing that our trainer did. Um, all right. And then other non-weight bearing mobility tasks. This should be the last um, little um, group in this section is for me bending down really um, angered my orthostatic intolerance. So I would bend down and then stand up and have a huge dizzy spell. My vision would black out. Um, so he could pick up anything that I dropped on the ground um, or load and unload laundry machines, especially like front loading if I was like bending down to load them. So um, whichever video plays next, I'll show Go that. Go take. Yeah. Go take. Pause up. Put it in the bin. Yes, good boy. Um, and then I think the next one is just him picking up something that I dropped, which is super helpful. <laughs> Good boy. Thank you. And that one like seems so like innocuous and just like a little, oh, super helpful and cute. But like that test, I think to me was one of the most helpful because I, you don't realize how much stuff you drop, how many times you bend down. And I just was constantly having dizzy spells all day until I could find a management technique, which was Hamilton. Um, all right. And then real quick, before we do the weight bearing mobility tasks, I did want to mention other non weight bearing mobility tasks that I didn't talk about is go getting a human for help during a coughing fit. If you have like a person that will help you. You can grab them. Um, throwing trash away for like CF related arthritis. If you have trouble like holding small things, they can carry it, that sort of thing. Um, and then weight bearing, you're going to see in this video, he does forward momentum pull so that I'm not using as much stamina when I'm walking. Um, and we don't have to. Can you pick it up? Mm -hmm. This is me showing like Good. Pizza. Good boy. All right, can we slow it down? <laughs> slow, easy. Okay. Good job, monkey. Um, and then for, uh, the oh, other picture on the side was just to show, um, that his harness has that upright handle. Um, and when I was getting dizzy, he did weight bearing mobility. So I could kind of grab onto that handle and lean just a little bit to the side and he would lean opposite me so that I wouldn't fall, which was really helpful. Um, and the disclaimer for weight bearing mobility is before you do any of these tasks with any dogs, you do need to work with a professional trainer and a veterinarian, because if your dog is not structurally sound, it's not safe for them to do, and it's not safe for you to be doing it with them. And also there are height and weight considerations, because if I were like six feet tall and Hanny was like a little chihuahua, it would not, it would not go super well. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're thinking about these like specific weight bearing mobility tasks. Um, the other one that I don't show here um, is bracing. So during a coughing fit, I could like put my hands just in between like where his shoulder blades are and just put a little bit of pressure to 
like kind of keep myself up. Um, not, um, you know, you don't, you really want to be gentle with service dogs um, because, you know, it's a lot of physical work for them. Um, so just something to keep in mind, but that was another task that I found really helpful. Um, the other tasks that I don't really talk about in here are psychiatric service tasks. Um, mental health comorbidities are a huge thing for cystic fibrosis. So I just wanted to add a note um, that with anything for a service dog, you should talk to your care team about what impacts you and you specifically, as you can hopefully tell these tasks are very tailored to me. Um, all right. And then real quick, the last couple, the last big section we're going to talk about is limitations of service dogs. I love service dogs. I think they are a game changer for lots of people with CF, but I do not think they're for everyone. Um, the big category I want to talk about is you are going to be the center of attention. It's not ideal if you have an anxiety disorder or social interactions are very unpleasant for you. People will come up to you. They will pet your dog and it's totally fine. It is totally understandable, but they will ask invasive medical questions, especially if your CF is not something that is particularly visible. Um, they also will sometimes like tell you about their dogs, which is really kind of a fun bonding experience. Um, but it is sometimes they like come up to you and try to talk to you and you're like, I just came here for like a five minute trip to grab, grab like a carton of milk, you know, and it is kind of complicating. Um, and as with all medical tools, discrimination is kind of a real thing that we face and we deal with. And it can become more of a problem if your CF was previously invisible. And now you have this dog that like kind of shows to everyone that something is like a little bit different. Um, the other things I wanted to talk about is you are, they are a dog. Um, they are going to be inconvenient at times. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to get sick. We were um, staying in a hospital once and Hamilton had an acute episode of um, vomiting and diarrhea, which was not ideal <laughs> because that was obviously quite a lot to deal with when I was also hospitalized. Um, so I also think that you need to talk to your care team, your support system about like how they're willing or able to like show up and help you if something like that does happen. Um, the other thing is that they are inconvenient in a lot of circumstances, like bathrooms. This is Hamilton in like an average bathroom stall. Um, we, you, you got to get in a lot of tight places with service dogs because the world was not meant for you and your 60 pound dog to go a lot of places. Um, and that's just something not everyone is comfortable with. And that is totally fine, but just something to think about if you're wondering if a service dog is the right option for you. Um, the last couple things that I have on here for limitations of service dogs is they are not really cheap. Um, any dog is going to cost money. Um, Hamilton's medical expenses, um, just this year alone, um, were, he had a lot of medical expenses. They were about $10,000. So I strongly recommend pet insurance literally saved his life this summer. Um, that is something to consider for any dog, but especially a service dog. Um, because if you, if your dog gets sick and you're relying on them a lot, that's like a really scary experience. Um, the other thing is that if you get a dog through a professional program, there can be fees associated with that. A lot of them will help you fundraise. Um, but that is just something to think about as far as resources go. Um, the resource document we send out has a ton of them, um, but these are great places to start. The Americans with Disabilities Act is the major federal law that covers service animals in the United States. It is the law that covers my ability to take Hamilton into a restaurant when I was sick, into the hospital. It covers basically everything except um, air travel and housing with some exceptions. Um, so that's a great place to start. The ADA has like a service dog FAQ that has a ton of information if you're ever curious. Um, a big thing that the ADA covers is there's no certification for service dogs. So if you go and you start researching service dogs, there are unfortunately a lot of scam registries that'll pop up, just something to be aware of. Um, I talk about it a little bit in the resource document, but they don't have any legal um, standing behind them. And I wouldn't want you to like waste your money on those kind of thing. Um, and then the last resource I really recommend is Assistance Dogs International. If you're interested in a, in a dog, if you want to find a service dog for you through a program, that is a great place to start. They have um, a database of accredited organizations and you can put in like your zip code or your general area and it'll search for you. Um, and I think that that is about all that I have for my specific presentation. Um, I think we can go into question and answer time. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Anna, Greg, and Kayla. You guys all did a fabulous job. It was such a great session. So I do have a couple of questions for each of you. So we'll start at the end. So Anna, since you just presented, I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. So did you, can you share a little bit about the finances with um, service dogs? Did you have to pay out of pocket for Hamilton or did the insurance cover portion? I think you mentioned fundraising, but can you just spend a few minutes uh, explaining that? Yeah, absolutely. So we paid out of pocket for Hamilton. Um, I, my high school actually had a very 
very interesting like senior project program and they were able to have like certain scholarships so we did get a little bit of like um, funding from my high school which was very interesting um and uh we kind of had just had some luck with like um I knew a trainer who trained service dogs and she was willing to help. Um, and she was a private trainer and, you know, we, it was just reduced rates. Um, if you are going to get a service dog from a program and they're a program that charges full price, you're going to be looking at about $20,000 roughly, depending on the program. A lot of programs will help you fundraise, um, to meet that goal. Um, but that is just the general like rule of thumb cost. Some health insurances may cover it, but my understanding is that is it, crazy process. There's a lot of doctor's notes involved. I have not been through it, unfortunately, um, but it is something to look into probably with your specific health insurance terms and conditions um, or like policy document. Okay, great. And then there was a question about your career. So did your experience with therapy dogs and service dogs inpatient affect your career choice to become a vet? Oh, definitely. That was like all of my vet school essays are written about. It's like something I get very emotional about. I really think we talk about in vet school a lot, the human animal bond and how like it can heal both ways. Um, and I think anyone here who's ever been having like a really bad day in the hospital knows that like a therapy dog can turn the whole thing around. Um, and my experience with Hamilton just made me realize like how much dogs mean to a lot of people. So I want to go to vet school, like, well, I am in vet school and I want to be a veterinarian that can like, you know, give back to people because I understand like if anything happened to Hamilton, I don't know what I would have done. So I want to give back to people in that relationship with their animals. That's wonderful. Just one last question for you, Anna, before we move on to Kayla and Greg. Um, what do you do about restroom breaks if you're in the hospital and you don't have a friend or a family member? Who helps you out with Hamilton? Yeah, so I have to take it myself. Um, the ADA um, has a specific thing that says like healthcare professionals, obviously they're very busy. They cannot, they're not required by federal law to take care of your dog. Um, I do know of some handlers that have like a portable litter, litter box set up basically, um, typically for like smaller dogs who only do medical alert um, and they can set that up in the hospital room. But I worked it out with my healthcare team where I I would wear like, you know, PPE to protect any other CF patients in the hospital and take him to the bathroom myself. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much for sharing. We all love Hamilton. We're like, we're <laughs> team Hamilton now. So thank you for sharing. Okay, we'll move to Kayla since you were the one before that. So um, there was a question about safely placing medications in the x-ray machine, or do you have them like hand check your medications when you're flying? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, so I definitely get a list of all the medications and all of my devices when I'm traveling that's signed by my doctors. And that will allow me to get everything hand checked so that I'm not putting anything through the x-ray machine just in case it were to like impact an oxygen concentrator or something. Um, and the TSA is like really receptive to this. I've never had a problem when I've traveled to any country. So yeah, it's been really nice to do that. And even now when I don't have devices, I always bring a page with all of my medications because they will always search like laxatives, powders, anything like that. So yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And what about how do you get your specialty meds like Pomazine or Trikafta? Do you get them mailed to you when you're traveling or how does that work? No, so um, it is really tricky. It takes a lot of logistically planning things. I don't get anything mailed to me because if I pick something up from the pharmacy or if somebody else picks something up from the pharmacy and they sign that they picked it up and it gets lost in the mail, I'm accountable for that medication. They're not gonna replace it. Insurance won't replace it. So what I've been lucky enough to do is to um, have friends come visit us when we travel. And usually I'll have like my mom come or some friends come. So actually yesterday I had a friend come down to Mexico and she drew, drove through California and met up with my dad. My dad had picked everything up and gave it to her. And I spoke to my medical team and they wrote a list of the medications with her name on it, saying she was bringing them all down to me because obviously they're all in my name. And then it was signed by my doctor and I gave that to her just in case she ran into any problems when she passed the border. And I got everything from her yesterday, but then um, like next month I'll have my mom come and I'll have her bring stuff. So it just takes a lot of um, that. But if I cannot have anybody come, cause obviously it's a huge out of pocket expense for them and they're not coming to bring medicine, they're coming for other 
points of travel and they're just doing this as a favor. Um, I actually have to fly back. So that's something, again, that we just have to budget out of pocket for. Um, next year, we're planning to go to Spain and live there for a while. So I'll just be flying back every three months um, to pick up more medicine and do my doctor's appointments. So I just have to plan for that. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. Last question for you, Kayla. Um, or actually, did you have an emergency like medical kit that you wanted to show us in a folder? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So sorry, I forgot to bring this when I was presenting. I was sitting across the room. So this is my um, emergency medical kit. It's listed here, the red and the blue. And then I have a key in the back zipper that um, this is like the example of my handwritten notes because I don't have a printer. So I write a key with everything on here so that people can easily find it if they need help and I can find it so I don't forget. And then I also have um, all my emergency contacts and lists of diseases and stuff in here too that I travel with. And then I keep a binder as well. This is, I'm not pregnant. This is my sonogram that I found in my family's house of me as a baby, but um, it's kind of awkward because it's there. So this is my folder that I travel with. And in this, I have um, a list of all my medications signed by my doctors. I also have a list of all um, my out of pocket, like, or not out of pocket, but, um, out of like hospital lists of like testing that I need. So it says it on here and then I bring this and I have everything printed out that I bring to every lab when I get tests done. And then I also have like all of my allergies, everything printed and everything easily accessible. And whenever I pass TSA or border crossings, I always have this out and ready to go so that they know that if they're gonna try to test me on any of this stuff, I'm gonna definitely fight back with everything that I have in these folders, so. Yeah, that's great. It's so great to be organized. So thank you for all those tips. Okay, we're moving on to Greg. So Greg, thank you so much. I know it's been a while since we heard from you now, but <laughs> um, what would you give, what would you recommend to someone who was just diagnosed to stay on top of their treatments? What are the top two things you'd recommend to them? Top two things for someone just diagnosed. Um, I would say definitely, especially when you're first diagnosed, remembering everything that you need to do that you didn't need to before is going to be the hardest part in my mind. Um, so thinking specifically about breathing treatments, I'd say, you know, get with your care team and just write everything out as granular as you can. And then I, w I would say probably some some phone reminders for the daily meds. I think if I had to pick two things, those are probably a good starting point. Okay, good. And what about like the time management? You said that, you know, a lot of your brain space is focused on your mechanical engineering. How do you break up your day, like your day schedule? Do you have like segments on your calendar to take breaks to, you know, drink water and take your meds? Like how do you manage the time? Time management. Uh, um, I feel like that's something that I could could ramble on about for hours and hours. Um, but in general, when I'm at work, I try to the best of my ability to practice kind of calendar blocking. So breaking my tasks up into kind of half hour chunks and dropping them through on my calendar, balancing that with the inevitable piles of meetings I end up in every day. Um, and, you know, trying to remember to take meds and stuff that if, if I, I think right now I don't, aside from occasionally in the afternoon, don't necessarily have much I need to take during the day. But if I did, it would probably try and work it into the system that I'm already doing for work. So it would probably go in as another calendar, um, calendar event. Yeah, good. Great. Well, we want to thank everyone for joining our session today. We had so much fun with you all, and we really appreciate your attention and your engagement and your questions in the chat. Um, this concludes our, our session, but we do want to ask you to go to the poll. It will be on, under the poll tab on the right-hand side of your screen. We'd love to know how you felt about today's conversation. And we really just, we wish you all the best, a healthy and happy 2024. And please enjoy the rest of Breathe Time. We have a lot more events today and tomorrow. So we hope to see you there. And we really just, um, we appreciate all of our speakers today. Anna, Greg, and Kayla, you guys did a wonderful job. And thank you all who, in the audience for filling out our poll before you take off to the next session. So thank you so much. Oh, hello, everyone. I hope today's event was filled with sharing stories, making new connections, and learning some new resources.
We had an amazing kickoff to our event today. Thank you again to our keynote speaker, Rayshon Jones. I am feeling alive, inspired, and ready to take on day two. So here is what's coming up tomorrow. To jumpstart day two, we will have welcome lounges and one-on-one -on -one chats beginning at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. You can join a welcome lounge to connect with other CFers in your age category. We also have a BreatheCon first timers welcome lounge, as well as one-on-one -on -one networking if you prefer that. To get to the networking for those that want to, on the left-hand side of your screen, you can navigate over to the networking tab. Clicking this icon will get you randomly paired with another attendee of the event for a five minute video conversation. You can choose to extend that time if you're connecting well with your partner and wanna chat longer, or simply move on to another match if you'd like to meet more of your fellow BreatheCon attendees. After that, we have many small group discussions, including topics for those on modulators, not on modulators, cystic fibrosis related diabetes, CF and body image, navigating cystic fibrosis in communities of color, and more. I know this is a lot of information, so remember you can always refer back to the schedule on the main event page for a refresher. We're looking forward to seeing you all back here tomorrow, but before you go, we would now like to invite you all to a happy hour to close out the night. Please find that in the sessions area.